Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones. This is part three of an ongoing four-part series on walls and the use of closed cell spray foam along with a little bit of half pound throwing in open cell foam from time to time. On parts one we went over uh, two by four construction, part two was two by six construction and now we're into part three here and I'm going to cover off the dynamic benefits of the closed cell foam system and open cell foam system compared to that of uh, your traditional bat. For most people this is going to be wood frame construction 2x6, 2x4, 2x8 utilizing uh, small housing act codes not generally major commercial projects and the reason for that is most commercial buildings are going to be of a different design, different material and then they're going to have an architect involved whereas uh, residential or light commercial is going to have a lot less regulation and different materials so that's what we're concentrating on. I think the first and fo foremost thing that we have to keep hammering home is the air leakage issue. When you are going with a fibrous system and you're choosing to, to do that because of cost or initial upgrade cost or, or lack thereof, install cost, the first thing that you need to understand is that you are you're going to be um, sacrificing air leakage and water movement for the rest of the life of the structure. And I think the reason that most people uh, talk themselves into it or don't give it a second thought is because they think, how bad is it going to be? What are we even talking about? And I think we need to take a look at some recent tests that were done called the Wall Energy Rating System to really examine just how pitiful and detrimental this system is because it will explain to you why you're having problems with building degradation, why you're having problems with higher op costs, and your your total life cycle assessment on the building is much higher with a fiberglass system than a spray foam system even though you had initial initially a much smaller out cost outlay to get the product into there the image that you're looking at now is sort of the cover sheet for a 2008 study done by the Institute for Research in, in Construction in Canada this is a major a government body that sort of studies uh, building materials similar to like Oak Ridge National Labs down in the United States and what they did was they they tested out a 2 by 6 wall 60 non center spacings they did one without penetration so that means like no electrical plugs no plugs to the outside absolutely no hole in the wall whatsoever and then they did one with penetration so you've got a fiberglass wall with penetrations one without and then you got a spray foam wall with penetrations here it shows that they did OSB on the outside. They did a weather resistant uh, weather barrier. So you're going to talk something like a Tyvek or house wrap. The air barrier that is used in the assembly is poly in the glass fiber wall sample. Uh, they had no exterior cladding on there and the wall dimensions are two and a half meters by two and a half meters. And then all penetrations are accordance to the CCMC guideline. This is just a cross section of what we're doing here. We've got um, our insulation, our spray foam on the right, and we've got our bad insulation or glass fiber on the left. Okay, here's the section that I really want you to see, the results. So they're, they're putting a normal flow rate of uh, air pressure. There has to be a certain amount of depressur depressurization and kilopascals. You don't, you know, what do you, what do you test it at? How many, how many kilopascals of air pressure are they testing? So 75 kilopascals in Canada is the normal pressure load for where we want to have our, our air leakage testing done at. This shows that the maximum allowable limit is 0 0.05 liters per square meter. This is the standard that we're trying to hit. So the entire reason of putting a six mil polyethylene vapor barrier up as an air barrier assembly is to achieve this, the 0 0.05. Now what we are seeing is when we go up to the fiberglass system here, that's what this, this is showing. This is a wall with no penetrations and this is a wall with penetrations. We see that at 75 kilopascals, we are uh, above 0.4. So we've gone from 0 0.05 to 0.4, the air leakage. So the air leakage here in this situation has shot up 
roughly around 400%. This is where I get the data from in the previous two videos where I talked about no penetrations, you have a 400% air leakage rate increase. This is what the drywall installed. Okay, so as soon as the sheetrock is put on, screws are put through, no screws are missing, eight inch spacing on the screws, right down the center middle of the studs, uh, no penetration in the wall, it increases the air leakage by a factor of 400%. You can see the results right here. With the penetrations in the wall, carrying on the 75 kilopascal line, it, it jumps to over 0.6, right? So 600% increase in air leakage. So we have conclusively shown that the problem with building degradation, condensation, water in the walls, ice in the walls, reduced insulating ability is air leakage. So once it gets past a tiny little hole, tiny little hole, this isn't even off the studs. This is just punching in your regular screws. So don't tell me that you can get everything perfect with the tape and the caulking and everything's going to be just fine and then you go and put the sheetrock up. It ruins it. It ruins it. Factor of 400%. Okay? This is changing how we think about things, but not fast enough in my opinion. So you're giving up that you're going to have a guaranteed amount of air leakage. Finding nails, finding staples, finding screws sticking through for rigid insulation. This is the source of your water inside of the walls. It's the air that's making it through the air barrier system. The fibrous does nothing. It doesn't stop it, right? So air just freely goes through it. It's just a filter at that point. Find something to condense in. When we deal with the spray foam system, here's our spray foam systems down here. Here's our spray foam system right down here. It's below the maximum allowable limit. So we're actually technically the only code compliant wall assembly with three inches of closed cell foam sprayed into a two by six wall, 60 non-center spacing. So I think this cannot be denied at all. I think it's absolutely relevant. If you are going to be building a house or a cabin or a garage or a new shop or what have you, think about this. You're dealing with an excessive amount of air leakage inside the walls. You're gonna be dealing with water buildup. You're gonna be dealing with potential mold growth. You're gonna be dealing with uh, ice in the walls, building degradation where it gets much, much cooler. The overall efficiency of the building is pulled down drastically, and as a result, heat loss goes up, operating costs skyrocket. So we've seen with the wall energy rating, the air leakage results, that air leakage is the number one thing that we need to be controlling. Once we control air leakage, then the insulation can do its job. With closed cell foam, it's using 1.5 million cubic inches worth of cells with inert gas to be the insulating value. Now when you're using an open cell product, a half pound foam, you're using steam, you're using carbon dioxide. Steam is, um, there's a phase change, water is in the foam, it's called a water blown foam. When the chain reaction and the uh, exothermic reaction happens, it converts the water from liquid to steam, the steam puffs open the cells, and that steam, that carbon dioxide is trapped inside uh, the cells of the foam. So even your open cell foam system is going to be vastly superior to your batted system. It still utilizes in cold weather climate, it still utilizes a vapor barrier, especially when you're shaving the skin off of it. Uh, you've put it into the wall and you've had to do a bunch of trimming. You've got, you know, the almost the maximum that you can get in it, but you had to shave a bit. You, you should be putting up a six mil polyethylene. You should be definitely caulking the seams. And the reason that it performs better in the glass is that the vapor at that point is really the vapor barrier is serving the function of a vapor uh, retarder or vapor diffuser. Uh, the air leakage issue isn't as detrimental. So you're not relying solely on six thousandths of an inch and that once you get past that plane of membrane, then you've got unfettered uh, air leakage. You cannot get airflow to easily go through six inches of open cell foam. I mean, I understand that it doesn't carry with it an air barrier material certification, but it is certainly an air seal. And if you take a look at that versus a mineral fiber bat, or especially a glass fiber bat, you're not going to be getting as much convective current through it, virtually none, and you're not going to be able to drive a, a breeze, a, a draft from one side of the, of the material to the other. 
So your air leakage results and the air leakage results inside of the wall assembly where you've got convective loops where people have said to me, well, they still are in denial. They still think they can get a really good vapor barrier. And I said, let's just pretend for a second that you do, that you've got this perfect air vapor barrier up. There's no penetrations, no leakage through it. You still are defeated because you're dealing with convective loops. And then say, well, what do you mean? Well, Five and a half inches is the dimensional lumber on a two by six, three and a half on two by four. So let's say you stuff it full of mineral fiber or glass fiber. Uh, you've got freezing cold sheeting, five and a half inches away. You've got warm 72, 71 degree interior sheeting, 20 degrees Celsius. So you have this temperature differential between inside to outside. The greater the temperature differential, like your interior temperature is going to stay constant, but the greater that you have a temperature differential to the outside, meaning extremely hot or extremely cold, the more buoyant the air is going to become within the assembly, and it's going to allow warm air to rise, cold air to fall inside the individual stud base. So you've got freezing cold sheeting, cold air is going to fall, warm air up against the drywall is going to rise, and you have a convection loop. If you have warm air rising, and you have cold air falling. Now, if that sounds a little complicated, just, just use something simple that we all can understand. Stand inside of a stairwell in a house on a two-story home. Do you feel a breeze occasionally? Can you put a, a potted plant on the step and watch the little leaves moving? Yes, you can. You absolutely can feel a breeze. It's not uncommon for people with r large rake walls, 20, 25 foot tall rake wall with glass windows at the top to feel air moving down their back when they're sitting in a couch or on a chair next to the outside wall. What's going on? Warm air is rising. It's cooling. Cool air is falling. You're getting a convective loop. All right. So that's at a large enough level to you to feel on your skin, to move the hair on your arm or on the back of your neck, right? Inside of a stud cavity, a convective loop can be much more minute. It has to be detected through, uh, Sci you know, highly specific calibrated scientific equipment but it's still going on the more of a convective loop that you have the overall efficiency of the stud cavity is pulled down so even when things are perfect you're still getting air moving within the assembly and rapidly picking up heat loss i go over this in the r value myth why why are the uh convect the the tests on the um, astm tests for thermal conductivity done with a one inch sample they're done with a one inch sample because they found where the open fibrous materials that a two and a three and a four inch sample would rapidly pick up heat loss because they had too much of a convective loop. So the thicker that the material got, the more convection was in it, it was actually skewing their results. Was it skewing the results or was it showing that they had hit a point where it was becoming detrimental? So inside of the st stud wall cavity, you've got convection going on. And that is stopped with open cell foam and closed cell foam because you cannot get air to go through it. The convection loops within the assembly are going to be ceased. Now, people have asked me from time to time, well, why don't we put the, the more expensive closed cell foam on? We'll put an inch or two of that, and then we'll put the open cell foam on. Well, for starters, you need to have the data on that. You need to have some actual written test reports. You can't just go in and just willy-nilly, I'm an advocate for having the science and having the calculations done with empirical evidence to make sure that the assembly as a whole is certified to do what it needs to do. All right? So there are very few, if any, that I know of. We've got our very first piece of data right now of seeing if we use two inches of closed cell foam and then we used eight or six, of open cell foam on top of it, where would the uh, the vapor drive be? You know, would would there be an internal um, dew line within the assembly? And I've got I've got the data on that. I could actually do an independent video on that down the road. But from practicality standpoint, folks, right? Just take a look at a two by six wall that's five and a half inches deep. Do you really want to go and put an inch, inch and a half, and then make the spray foam guy switch out or get a different product and then fill the rest of it up? between the time to flush out or switch or bring a different rig or do a different product, right? You're not really saving a whole lot. What are you going to save? Maybe 50, 50 cents a square foot compared to what it would have been if you just kept going with another, another inch, inch and a half of closed cell. I've never found where the finances have aligned. Usually you pick one product, stick with it, get set up, get going and don't switch. 
I've never found where switching products has been beneficial financially. And, and that's the only reason you do it, is try to offset some cost. Uh, either you believe in the one product or not. If you, if you don't believe in, uh, in the closed cell phone because it's too expensive, and then don't get it. Get the guy to come in and do 100% open cell foam. Put up a poly vapor barrier if you have to have it in your state or your province. And, and deal with it as it comes. If you believe in the closed cell foam, pony up the cash. I know it's a lot more money, but uh, you don't hear of people out there wanting to get the least amount of rebar and the least amount of concrete. And they're trying to, hey, I don't want an 8-inch foundation. I want a 6-inch foundation. I don't want a four inch slab floor i'd like a two inch slab floor like no like put the money where the money needs to be skip all the fancy stuff for right now get the bones of the structure done well then you're not going to have building degradation it's not going to cost you very much put 20 or thirty thousand dollars towards the insulation in your budget and then you're not going to be disappointed you'll have enough to get the the premier product and everything after that is being built inside of an ultra warm high tech dry shell it just makes perfect sense to me Okay, racking strength results. Uh, I did a, a, a video dedicated to this back in like 2018, but ah, we'll do a new version of it here, and we'll quickly get through this. BSF performed this test 2007. Three wall designs here. Two by four walls with double top plate, one inch of styrofoam on outside, uh, 12 R12 bat, and then drywall. Two by six with double top plate, 24 on center, 716 OSB oriented strand board, R20 bats, half inch sheetrock, and then a 2x4s, 2x4 wall with a single plate, 24 on center spacing, 1 inch of polystyrene board on the outside, and 3 inches of closed cell foam. This is what the apparatus looks like that's testing it. They're putting it on a, um, a rack load and it's going to be pulling down on it and testing and measuring deflection. This just shows the wall assemblies as being sprayed. Here's what we want to get to. The results. Oh, I think I need to go back just one. All right. There we are. So, the results. Here we have our 2x6 wall receiving the most deflection. And then we have our batted 2x4 wall. This, uh, this has double plates. And then at the bottom we have our 2x4 uh, spray foam wall, single plate, and three inches of closed cell foam. So here's the bottom, right? Two by four wall, single plate. You understand what that means? That means horizontally at the top, there's not two two by fours at the top. There's one two by four. And here's our deflection load: point uh, one point one five, one point nine four, two point nine four. There's nothing even close. I mean, the, the two by six with double. Uh, keeps up ever so slightly but keep in mind that we're we're one and a half inches or actually two inches less of lumber five and a half down to three and a half right they're getting 2.94 we're getting 2.94 almost at 20 2500 pounds per foot so and then here's your regular two by six wall with a double plate right and these are 24 on spanner spacings so blowing the doors off of the regular conventional construction two by six system with three inches of closed cell foam. Now this is a huge benefit to anybody that is in uh, seismically active areas or anybody that wants to be living on a valley edge or a hill or an open prairie, anywhere that you're receiving a lot of wind load, uh, especially if you're going to be building a home with a lot of architectural designs where there's going to be a lot of overhangs, there's going to be a lot of tall rake walls, You've got a lot of transition areas that are very tall or very steep or very angular. Uh, closed cell foam should be used exclusively to strengthen and stiffen an already structurally sound structure. Like your engineer is going to be drawing the house and the structure, the trusses and the floor and, and the walls and everything else to be structurally stand strong on their own. But then why not add this? I mean, remember, this is a two by four wall. This isn't a two by six wall. Imagine if we had a 2x6 wall, double plated, and then 3 inches of spray foam. Think of the deflection and the racking strength on that. So there's just there's no comparison. I live on a valley edge. And I've said over and over again, I've got 3 inches of closed cell foam on the walls of my house. 
I could not imagine being on the edge of a valley where we get some really strong northwest winds uh, and be batted. One due to the air leakage and the second due to the, the, the load strength. You can actually feel the buffeting action of the wind hitting the house and trying to move the house. This works great for unvented roofs, folks. Truss uplift is a real thing where the, the wind comes in underneath the roof, tries to pick the roof up. It'll cause drywall cracking in certain situations. This is where uh, Simpson Strong Tie and a lot of uh, rafter cleats are being used to pin down the roof rafters with extra fasteners, extra screws, and that's fine. It would never deny doing any of that, but then why not add three or four inches of closed cell foam and just weld and glue the whole entire structure uh, together. It makes absolute sense. So blowing the doors off, uh, the conventional structure with air leakage, thermals inside the wall, convective air currents, and finally racking strength. So in closing out this part three, I think we've taken a good view of the stats on the, on the wall energy and the air leakage, uh, the superior qualities of the insulation, the total building envelope dominance of eliminating air leakage, moisture movement throughout the wall assembly, the structural support that it adds, uh, the lack of convective current within the assembly, the superior air sealing characteristics of the assembly, including the caulking, obviously, we seal the, the joints. Um, the last thing, the fourth point in all of this that I, I find is a big benefit is um, uh, design changes. When, you are, when you're dealing with closed cell spray foam or even open cell, but particularly uh, the closed cell, because the closed cell is your all-in-one air vapor barrier. The beauty of that product is that you can use steel stud, you can use exterior grade drywall, dens glass, zip sheeting, plywood sheeting, OSB, buffalo board, right? You can use a whole bunch of different building materials and techniques, membrane, no membrane, on and on and on. You can use all sorts of complexity, staggered stud wall, straight wall, you name it. You can build turrets, you can build complex corners. As long as you can get the foam into the space, you can get it sealed, right? So you can mix all these different, everything from metal to wood to concrete, and it can all be spray foamed. And I've dealt with people that have had panels. They've dealt with uh, structurally insulated panels, and there's been a backlog on the panels, or they have need to make a change on sites, so and now they're conventionally framing uh, a wall to make those changes. Uh, or they're waiting for panels, or panels are expensive, and then they need to get a crane truck, a crane uh, truck to site. So the spray foam allows you to pick your framer, use conventional building materials, use a conventional drafts person to draw up any design that you want, and we can put the spray foam into it. We can put the foam internally in between the studs. We can put it externally on the building if you want to do um, a step Z-girt and siding, or you want to do brick ties and a brick. Uh, exterior it all can be done I I've never seen something quite as flexible as the spray closed cell foam because you can choose all of your people choose all of your products and then use the foam to glue it all together and insulate it and have your vapor seal uh, breakfast nooks and turreted roofs and um, wine cellars and the backs of stairs and odd cantilever overhangs and architectural decks where the deck comes out of the bedroom or off of the kitchen or something over top of living space below uh, garages that are fully over top of um, uh, warm space below I've even seen people that have put um, a garage poured concrete over top and had like a full gymnasium and basketball and everything underneath their uh, underneath their garage and they were like, how are we going to insulate the, the slab? Uh, and the answer was simple. We don't need to glue anything. We just need to go in and, and fur it out and, and put this closed cell spray foam to it. So I've not encountered a product that is as versatile as this. Any type of design that you want to do can be done. And the spray foam closed cell especially can be incorporated into, into the design. And then when you take into account the air leakage, the structural support, and the superior insulation and water characteristics of the foam, you've got this winning building material that is, a, is as advanced as tomorrow. It really is a total building dominant product. Um, the only reason that you would shy away is trying to save some cost and you're gonna have a lot of trade-offs with conventional sheet products, screws, fasteners, and you're back into this air leakage wet and things not fitting and things not going together well and then there's gonna be building 
degradation, things breaking, things getting wet, things rotting, things coming apart. So uh, I know it's a, bit, a little, little bit of a longer video, but consider this. I haven't had very many people that have uh, paid the bill to get closed cell spray foam, whether they've spent 10000 20000 30 40 even I had one guy spend over 50000 and beyond to get closed cell foam entirely into the structure. I've never had one of them uh, regret it. Uh, they've all been happy with the purchase, happy with the thermals on the project, and it's just been an amazing, amazing uh, purchase, and as, as it should be. This is a, a lifetime, longevity, multi-generational purchase, and it's a high-performance product. So in part four coming up, we're going to take another swipe at sort of the flash and bat questions as to why to do to not to do. Uh, we'll take a look at a little bit lightly on some uh, sound qualities. We've already addressed that in another video, but we'll address it here. And we'll take a look at the barn dominium phenomenon and sort of uh, conventional framing uh, with 2x6 walls versus doing posts and doing all the trade-offs that that entails on the last video. So hope you stick around, leave a comment, uh, like and subscribe, and we'll see you soon.